Does healing occur today as it did 2,000 years ago? Evangelist Freddie Clark has dedicated his life to saving people through the supernatural power of Jesus Christ. The heart of his ministry is to heal the sick and free the oppressed in modern day America. This is the story of a man driven to show people the power of a compassionate God. From the dreams of a young boy to the reality of a man, little did Freddie Clark know, destiny would take his life a very different way. This little farm just outside of a small town in southwest Virginia is home to Freddie Clark, his wife Sylvia, and their nine sons and two daughters. The older children now have families of their own, but the five younger siblings still live at home and help with the family farm. Right now, as I speak to you, we are in, we're on the farm, resting here in Rocky Mountain, Virginia, where we have a beautiful garden. I'm a planter of seeds, not just seeding a big family, but I've always been able to plant and grow things, even if I didn't get to harvest at all. The harvest went to everybody, but I was the planter and the seeder. It's like now, we've got 16 boxes of squash here that we will never eat at all. We freeze it, but we have to give it away and feed people. But we're the ones that planted it. And uh, we plant about an acre and a half of garden. And uh, we plant everything that I like to eat. <laughs> There's a few things that uh, I plan I don't like to eat, but there's lots of things I don't like I don't plant. And they ask for it, but most everybody in the family eats what I eat because they just followed me around all their life. We homeschooled them, uh, kept them out of the clutches of the corruptible society, kept them pure, kept them holy. And if Dad likes it, I like it. See, that's the concept. They watch me and see if, if there's a new food to eat. If I'll eat it, they'll eat it. In other words, Dad eats the best. That's how we're going to eat, too. And so as I speak, we have coming in spinach, Beet greens, which I love. Swiss chard, which I love too, because you can cut the tops off and it'll grow back all summer. The tomatoes are green. I've ate 
three that are ripe so far. But the peas are ready and I've been eating the peas. I've been eating yellow string beans. The green string beans are not quite ready. Today we dug up red potatoes. They were so delicious. You can't explain the taste of it all. And this is God's creation. If you will work by the sweat of your brow and till the soil, you will have a crop. First thing we do, we take a nice basket of red ripe tomatoes from the garden. We wash them, which these are all washed. And then the next process is we boil them, which is called blanching, so the skin's break. If you notice, the skin has just broke off of these, and now they're ready to be put into the jars, into the sealers. Okay, the girls are um, decoring and de-skinning the tomatoes. All right, you have to put a teaspoon of salt in each and stir it around. Wipe off the lids real clean, put the new clean lids on, and wipe off the jars, and then we put them in to the pressure cooker. And this is the pressure cooker. And we got seven jars in there that have to come to a rolling boil for 30 minutes. And then you take them out and let them cool, and one by one, they start snapping. When you hear them snap, then you know they're sealed. And so far we have about 90 jars. I had the great pleasure and benefit of lending a hand in the garden and then enjoying the bountiful harvest at the dinner table. Oh Jesus Christ, we thank you for this food today and all the hands that prepared it and the garden that grew it. We know there's a lot of work to grow food, but it pays off when we eat it because it tastes delicious. The best vegetables I ever tasted in my life. Thank you for more. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> These are red Irish potatoes right out of the garden today. Give me some. Really? All right, all right. There you go. It's like a hot Hallmark film. Chicken, 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 chicken. Just keep cutting, Abraham. There's plenty there. Hey, Abraham, you want to I can't leave home because I won't have any real food anymore. I'll have to sit in a restaurant and eat artificial food. I was born May the 5th, 1943, in a little place called Mars Hill, state of Maine. I was born at the foot of the only mountain in that area, which was called Mars Hill Mountain. We lived on a farm that was located on Clark Road. On the farm, we were totally self-sufficient. We had chickens, cows, horses, pigs, anything you could think of was on that farm. My grandmother only went to town once a week, but she never took any money with her. She took her eggs 
and she traded her eggs for her necessities, which were only molasses and sugar and salt, I believe it was. And everything else, we raised it on the farm. We canned, we picked the fruit, we stored it in the cellar. We had a potato farm. My father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather all worked the potato farm. All our farming was done by horses. My grandfather would not sit on a tractor, and so I learned to farm with him with the horses. Freddie learned the value of family and hard work from his rustic childhood. Growing up on a farm taught him discipline and self-reliance and that the only thing more important than family is God. We took our potatoes to town and sold them and we stored them all winter in the potato house. But uh, thousands of barrels of potatoes would be in there. So during the winter when the price come up a few cents we would scoop up 40 barrels and put them on the truck, take them downtown and sell them at the railroad station. And they'd carry them down to New York and Boston and there they would distribute them. Now my grandmother on my mother's side was also a Pentecostal. Uh, actually, I'm a fourth generation Pentecostal and my children are a fifth generation Pentecostal, all 11 of them. My grandmother's name was Alice Squibb. Alice was a Salvation Army captain. She was used of God even in healing. She had a healing ministry. She was very sickly herself. Although healing worked in her, it didn't work for her. It flowed through her for other people, but not for her. My mother watched her mother, Alice, raised from her deathbed seven times. She was dying and dead and raised up from her deathbed seven times. Now, after all her sicknesses, she finally died at 48 years of age. Before she died, she called my mother to her and told her, she said, I've been very sickly and this ministry has never reached fruitivity or its fullness with me and I'm, I'm going to die and you're going to get married and you're going to have a son, you're going to have one son and he's going to carry on the healing miracle ministry that I could not do in life. So remember that. And now my mother never told me that. Not until I myself was getting married in 1973, and uh, she told my wife Sylvia that story. She never told me that story. And Sylvia, of course, is the one who told me about it. My mother's passed away now in 1993. After that, we went up on the hill where we had our high school, which was called ACI, Aroostook Central Institute. So I had four years there. And as I'm sitting at home, I'm thinking, maybe I should preach the gospel. Maybe I should go in the ministry because you can do that till you're 120 years old. <laughs> I was getting ready to graduate now. This was my last year. I would soon be 18 in May. Right in the middle of that winter, my father took sick with acute arthritis and rheumatic fever. He got exposed pastoring up in Ashland, Maine. He had built five churches and pastored them. And the weather got to him and he went to bed. They took my father to Boston to my mother's people. Her name was Squibb. They took him there and in two weeks time he was healed by a sovereign move of God. Nobody laid hands on him and prayed for him. So now the Lord's healed him and he's running all over the place and he's got a job and they come to my graduation. They take me to Boston and now that I'm in Boston, I'm 50 miles from the Bible college in Providence. And so the rest is history. I went to Zion, three years and graduated. I met uh, little David Little David Walker, the, the child preacher of the 40s. So generally speaking, uh, my move to Zion 
uh, thrust me into the ministry in areas where our circle back in Maine, New Brunswick, could have never taken me in a million years because they were too narrow to accept it. So I realized right then and there that I only had one more year in school, and when I got out of school, I'd be 21 years old. And I was going to have to find out something about me and what I was doing, but I realized that I couldn't preach the way I should and I'd been in school for three years and others could do it. This was the year that I went on a major fast while in school. Now I went 150 days on this fast. Don't panic, it wasn't a straight 150 days, but it had a pattern to it. I would fast a whole day. Then I, the next day I would fast a meal. The next day I would fast two meals, and then the third day again, which is now the fourth day, I would fast the whole day again. And that was my pattern. At this point, I was preaching like a man from another world, having completed the 50 day, or rather the 150 days of fasting for the purpose of preaching. So lots of times they would jump up in the middle of my message and get healed, or get the Holy Ghost just while I was preaching. And they never got healed when I laid hands on them. But they, they might once in a while while I was preaching. In those days, they had prayer lines. They would form them at the end of the meeting without asking. You didn't invite them. They just did it. And I hate to see prayer lines because it's just an exercise in futility. Nobody's going to get healed if I pray for them. I can lay hands on them all day and nothing ever happens. Some people claim to feel a little bit better, but when I see the prayer line coming, I try to get the headaches and the toe aches in the front of the line and the wheelchairs and the stretchers in the back of the line. And I rearrange the line, hoping to get tired halfway through the prayer line and dismiss myself and go home and only have to deal with the easy cases. So it always grieved me when they'd form that prayer line because I know my work was cut out for me and I didn't have it. It was during that time in 1965 that we were in a town of Weston, West Virginia, when the gift of healing kicked in in my life. I'd been praying for the sick now for four years and nobody ever got healed. And this revival where I prayed for this boy with cancer of the throat, I had my hand on his throat and I felt the cancer move and it dissolved or jumped out of his throat. I could feel it when it left. I thought it was my imagination. I said, no, that's just a quirk. But when he began to shout after having no voice at all, and his backslidden mother ran to the altar and got saved over it, came back to God, uh, then I realized it was a miracle. I realized that miracles are for the purpose of saving people. It's a hook that holds you to the judgment day. You can never forget what God did for you personally. And so the boy was healed. Uh, actually, it was just God testing me for four years to see if I was serious, because once you get a gift, you can't lay it down. You're obligated till you die to operate it. You can't, you can't escape it. You have to use it. The very next church, Everybody I laid my hands on got healed. The next church the same way, the next church the same way, like a dam broke, like uh, I had busted out of prison. The whole paradigm had switched. I was at some strange level.
65, when nobody ever got healed by the laying on of hands, now everybody was getting healed by the laying on of hands. One year later, having been another ministry, I was with Whittington, uh, I said under this last ministry of Revelation, Word of Knowledge, and I stayed with him uh, 21 days, three weeks. I finally had to leave after finances and went to Mount Airy. North Carolina, but I, I preached and I didn't have no trouble preaching, but I knew that this was the night I had to operate in the Word of Knowledge. And I had to count on being seated by the Word of Knowledge ministries I had been under in the past. So at the end of the message, I stopped and it seemed like 20 minutes I sweat. Finally, I spit it out. I said, somebody here's got a headache. That was my first word of knowledge. <laughs> then I really died because nobody moved for another 20 minutes. Finally, a woman came up and said, it's me. I said, why don't you stand up in the first place? You put us through the mill here. But what was happening was I was birthing it. And when you birth a baby, in this instance, a baby gift, it's a lot of travail and anguish and anxiety and stress, strain. Death, you die the death. So we prayed for her, her headache went away because healing had been with me now for a year. We dismissed, went home, that was it. And after that, I had to work in the second gift that I'm known for, the word of knowledge. It wasn't easy. The pressure got great. I didn't want to go to church. I thought I was fooling the people. I was making it up. I, I, I couldn't understand why everything I said was right. And I had no way of knowing that it was right. It just came to me and I spoke it and it was right. But I said, this is gonna catch up with me and I am gonna be ruined. My ministry is gonna be ruined. So I'd rather not go to church, but I had to go to church because I was by myself and I had to eat and have a, make a living. So we continued on under much stress. I loved to sing and I, at this point I loved to preach because it just flowed out of me. But knowing that dread time was coming, knowing that when this sermon is over, I got to quit enjoying myself. I, I've got to face the music. It's going to be death again. And I feel now, since I So the pressure was getting enormous, so I decided I'd go on another one of those major fasts. I went on the second fast, 
long fast for 120 days. And this fast was for one reason alone also, as the first fast was to be able to preach, this one was to get rid of this nagging word of knowledge that was bugging me and pressuring me so bad, I would rather take a whip and then go to church. I didn't want to go to church because I knew what I had to face when I got there. People drove 100, 200 miles to hear from uh, heaven, hear the word of the Lord, hear the revelation, what God had for them. And I still thought it was just a, a fluke. I was making it up. And as I said, I couldn't understand why I was always right, but I, I couldn't take the pressure of that. So in 66, this fast was conducted to get rid of the gift of the word of knowledge. Now that might seem strange to you, but even stranger it was when the word of knowledge did not leave at the end of the fast, it came stronger than ever. I said, wow, I might just well have been fasting for the word of knowledge because here it was. God honored the sacrifice and now the knowledge had reached such a level that I could feel free to go back to church without pressure. And so I did. And from 1966 to 2010, these two gifts, which are 45 years old and 44 years old, which are the work of the miracles and the word of knowledge, I vowed when the healing came and then a year later, when the revelation came that I would always operate them. I would always try, no matter how hard it was, no matter how tough a night it was and what unbelief and opposition I had, and I had plenty of it, right to the point of hatred and stoning, which is the marks of a true prophet, is one who's despised and rejected and stoned. That's what Jesus taught, but I've never gone to church in a revival and been given the floor since 1965 and 1964, but what I haven't operated in those two gifts. Now, I've been in gospel sings and concerts where I didn't operate because it wasn't a revival. And I don't take over any man's meeting. I don't go into church and just start taking over because it's not authority. That's not the laws of authority. It don't work that way. When they give me the mic and give me the floor and introduce me and tell me to go forward, then I have been given permission and given the authority by man, having already been given the authority by God to do the work. In that setting, for 50 years, I've evangelized. But for 45 and 44, I have never ceased to operate any time I've been in that revival city. Praise the Lord. Here's that Methodist preacher that got his uh, ears healed. Got blind in her right eye, and the doctors gave her up, but she received 2020 sight and read the clock on the wall. Yes. You still see perfect tonight? Yes. This is how the tent ministry came about. And his name was Bowman, Bill Bowman. So I bought his tent. I gave him half down. And he really didn't, really didn't want to sell it, but he was in a financial bind. He had to come up with some money. Well, he put it up in Lake Wales, Florida, in the sand there. And wouldn't you know, the second night, storm come, knocked it to the ground, and there I was with the stub of a microphone on the platform singing in the blinding rain. <coughs> now, this tent <coughs> was a 70 by 130, but that's a big tent. But we put it back up, and I patched it. Well, patched it and then put it up, and preached. The third night, I was back in the tent again, and I learned right then that 
to find anchors to put in the sand to hold a tent in the sand during a windstorm. I raised the money during that tent meeting. I believe it was thousand or twelve hundred dollars to get a trailer, like a tractor trailer trailer. And we had it hauled down and placed it beside the tent. Now we had a place to store things and to uh, put the equipment in at night, lock it up, and a base to operate the tent out of because previously to this, the tent is just sitting there. At least if we took the tent down, we could store it in the truck and have it hauled somewhere. But the Lord kept blessing us, and I raised the next offering was uh, 800 or 1,000, and bought a gasoline tractor to hook onto that truck. That's how it was in 67 when I bought the tent and bought the truck. Now we had chairs, like 200 chairs came with the tent when I bought the tent. So we had chairs. Now we're still playing music with our guitars. And I said, uh, you know, we really need an organ. So we went up to the Holiday Inn up near Haines City and they were selling a Hammond organ and uh, its speakers. So I went back to the people, and we raised the money again. We bought the organ and the Leslie's, actually a tone cabinet, and the Leslie, we bought Leslie's later on. Now we had a tent, a trailer, a tractor truck to haul it, and we had an organ. And then we needed a sound system, so we raised money for a sound system. Through the years after the tent started, I had many crews, bands, staffs, as many as uh, maybe 15 at one time, mostly young men traveling with us. We had three tractor trailers, a bus, travel trailers, pickups, and cars. It was an actual caravan that traveled. I remember going from San Antonio to Sussex, New Brunswick, Canada in one haul. Back then in 72, that cost me $2,000 to go 3,000 miles with that entire caravan, which was cheap. Like all people who choose a life wholeheartedly dedicated to the service of the Lord Jesus Christ, Freddie went through times of difficulty and hardship. 1981 was one of the toughest years of Freddie's ministry. In 2007, Freddie Clark started a television ministry, and this is a segment pulled from that series. 1981. That was the most difficult year of my ministry, as I recall. I just bought a new tent, and it was a vinyl tent. Up until then, I had used canvas tents, which mildew. After three years, they rot, and you have to throw them away. They're just rags. But a vinyl tent lasts and lasts and lasts. In fact, I still have that vinyl tent today. We took the tent to Greenville, Alabama. It was up for the first time. And while we were there, my leg really gave out on me. And so did the drive shaft of the bus. It fell out in the street. And we swung off to a vacant lot with the bus. And there it sat. What are we going to do? And when we got out, there was a telephone pole there and a metal casing tacked to the pole that identifies the pole. Well, the numbers on that pole was the exact numbers of the day that I would go into the hospital and the day and the date that I would come out again. And uh, I did go to Portland, Maine and undergo surgery with my leg. And the crew took the tent and went to McMinnville, Tennessee. And they put that brand new tent up for the second time. And uh, like on the second night, a tornado came through there and ripped it all to pieces. Now the bus was gone. The tent was gone. My crew were young fellas and they was off seeing their friends and they were so tired they fell asleep and they run into each other and wrecked 
both the trailer and the tent truck. I had lost the use of my leg. I had lost the tent. I had lost the bus, and I'd lost the truck. So leg, tent, bus, and truck were gone in 81 by the early summer. And that's everything you need to be in the tent ministry, and now it was all gone. So I'm laying on my bed, and I can't walk, and I get news that a storm has wiped everything out, and I don't don't want to live, I want to die. I, it's all over. What can I do now? The first thing that happened was that I went to a gospel sing and they spotted me and asked me to sing, so I was on crutches. I was getting down to the end of the song when the Spirit spoke to me and said, throw these crutches in the wall. And without thinking, which is the key of obeying God, two key words are quit thinking. I threw the guitar. Somebody caught that, thankfully, because it was borrowed. And then I threw the crutches. Now I walked one side of the church, down that aisle, back up the other aisle. I, I kept walking around the church. The Lord had healed me. Now a good preacher friend of mine, Brother Floon, from uh, Lincoln, Maine, helped me that summer to find a truck. We took the old body, the box body, off the old truck. It was intact. And we put it on the new truck. So we had a new truck. We sent the tent back to David Wine, and he reworked it. And he said, I can fix it. So he fixed it. It was a little bit shorter, but he did fix it. So now we had the tent back. We had a new truck and a new tent, and my leg had got healed. Now all we needed was the bus. Now we had a gasoline-driven open road motorhome for all the years since uh, I was on the road. And we meet this fellow who has a 4104 diesel bus, which was light years ahead of ours. And we were able to get that bus, and it was paid for. We got it paid for. Now to this day, I cannot recollect, and my mind is totally foggy, about how in the world did we ever pay for these things that year when God restored it to us. I didn't have a dime. I didn't have a nickel in my pocket. And every day something would happen until we were restored what we lost, but what we got back was ten times better than what we lost. We had a ten times better leg, a ten times better tent, a ten times better truck, and a ten times better bus. And even the tent was more solid than it was when we bought it new. It had been strengthened against storms. So here is uh, all these things restored to us without a nickel and tenfold better and the worst year of my life, the worst year of my ministry, wound up by fall to be a year of total restoration. And that is a miracle. It's a whole set of miracles. Now I go to uh, Rocky Mount, Virginia, a town that uh, the family eventually migrated to. I'm putting my tent up on 220 South. The meeting is a good meeting, and one night a woman comes with a baby. She has just come from the University of Virginia Hospital in Charlottesville. So she has to give up on everything, and she goes by the tent, and she sees the sign on the truck that says, Salvation, Healing, Miracles, 7.30 p.m. She said, I need a miracle. And she didn't analyze it and listen to critics and scoffers. She just came on. And she never been in church, never been in a tent revival either. So she's sitting there petrified, and she has the baby all covered up. She don't want her seen, which I know none of this. She just she's in the crowd. That's all. And I'm walking around, waiting to see who to pray for next. And I spot her, and I call her out and tell her about the hospital, the baby, and the baby's going to die. 
and it's still alive and it has no brain. It was born without a brain. It has no eyeballs. And so I pray, she leaves, the tent goes down, I forget about it. Two years later, to the sponsoring church, which is my father-in-law's church, the Blue Ridge Gospel Tabernacle of Rocky Mountain, Virginia. Two years later, on an Easter Sunday morning, the same woman shows up. She comes up to the front and asks my father-in-law, who was the pastor, can I say something? And he looks at her kind of close and discerns that she's not dangerous, so he's got to let her say something. He says, yes. So she comes up and she testifies that that day she has just returned from the University of Virginia Hospital, the greatest hospital in Virginia at Charlottesville. And uh, she has a doctor's report that the baby has grown a brain in the past two years. The same baby they sent home to die of no brain has now grown a brain and has grown eyeballs. Her eyeballs are blue. And they send the report back with her that the baby as well has a brain and eyes. She also has the first report when she came back two years previous where it has no brain, no eyes, it's going home to die. So she takes this little girl up on the stage and shows her off to the congregation. Little blonde haired, blue eyed girl with a total brain in her head, according to the University of Virginia. The first time that there's any record of a child growing a brain after it was born and eyes to boot. Now, of course, we don't hear anything about it because it's just an embarrassment to the medical profession and they're not going to say anything about that because they didn't do it. God did it. This little girl uh, grew to be 18 years old and she became a horse rider. Finally, she won the first prize in America that was being held across the United States. Our hometown paper picked it up and she's on the front page as American champion writer. And so they're telling her story on the front page. And in the story, the mother tells the story of how she was brought to the tent when she was first born, ready to die. The paper was not going to carry the story, but she said, you cannot have the story unless you tell the whole story. This is why the girl's alive, and this is why she won the championship and this is why you are writing about her because she won the championship, which would have never happened if she hadn't lived, and would never happen if she had never grown a brain and never had grown eyeballs to see with. And so they told the whole story in the paper because the mother insisted. And that mother goes far and wide and tells the story about her daughter. She's almost an evangelist now. When, when she first came to the tent, she didn't even know God. So the time went on, years went by, and finally I met Sylvia. I met her in a tent meeting in Bradenton, Florida when I was a little David. David had called the family to come to the tent in Bradenton after I had left Bradenton and went to Orlando. I took a Monday night off and left Orlando to check on my tent in Bradenton. I drove the 100 miles. That was the only night that Sylvia and her sisters came to that tent meeting. That's where I met her. I met my husband, Freddie Clark, at an old-fashioned tent revival in Bradenton, Florida. Uh, he was there checking on his equipment and his tent that he allowed a friend of his to use at the time, and that, that wonderful preacher was little David Walker, a mighty well-known evangelist in his day. and. Little David Walker and his wife, Kathy, bless their hearts, they're very precious. They called in the telephone book. They saw my dad's name in the telephone book. His name is Joseph Crandall. And they said, we know him, and he has daughters that sing. My God is real. He's real in my soul. 
My God is real, for he has washed and made me whole. His love for me is like pure gold. My God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. So he called and he said, Brother Crandall, would you please come over to our tent revival and bring your daughters, we want them to sing. So my dad said, sure, I'll be glad to do that. So that's what happened. We went to a tent revival of Little David Walkers in Bradenton, Florida. I believe it was 1972. The spring of 72 and by the spring or June rather of 73, we would got married. Then we had our children. Now, as they began to come along, uh, they took the place of the tent crews for the most part. We started having sons galore, one right after another, after another. And now we had 11 children, and every one of them starts with an A. Alan, Aaron, Adam, Ashley, Andrew, Austin, Alexander, Abraham, Avery, Amy, and Amber. Uh, Alexander and Abraham were identical twin boys, and Amy and Amber were fraternal twin girls. So after nine consecutive sons, we had two daughters. I trained them when they was five years old to play music, because I learned when I was five. I didn't have a teacher. My father showed me three guitar chords. We had a console radio that stood on the floor and I'd get my guitar and I'd sit down beside the radio and pick along with him. I'd hear a lick and I'd say, man, that's nice. I wish I could do that. And I'd fuss around and fuss around and imagine how it's supposed to sound, the ups and the downs and the speeds. And, the... and I would find that lick. Of course, I did much praying and much practicing. I'd practice till my fingers would bleed. So without being able to read a note and with no teacher, the Lord taught me how to play. And today I play 20 instruments. I play it by ear. Each instrument that the boys and the girls have, I gave them the instrument and showed them how to play it because I first knew how to play it myself. So they grew up playing and singing, and uh, but they would take one instrument and they would go to the rafters with it. They would perfect it. They would zoom in and hone in and uh, take it to another dimension beyond what I could do. See, I, I was a jack of all trades and they became a master of one. And whatever instrument they developed, they became the best at it. Like Austin today is the number one dobro player in Nashville. We played in churches as they grew up and they quoted scriptures and uh, they traveled on a bus all their life, sometimes two buses, one time three buses. And that's how we lived. I would drive all night after church and they'd sleep all night. I'd get into the next town. Early in the morning I'd pull into town and Sylvia would take the kids out of the bus. I would sleep all day to church time. And I would get out and preach and they'd minister with me, sing, play. And then we'd leave for the next town and they'd go to bed, sleep all night while I drove. In the early 90s, the boys began to be able to play a little bit on their instruments and develop them. And I thought, well, this could improve if I took them to bluegrass festivals. So we went to the Galax Fiddlers Convention, which was more of a contest than a festival a historical event in Galax, Virginia. And we won the best bluegrass band out of 400 bands. We were a novelty to them. Uh, we met different promoters there, and we'd go to other festivals for the sake of the practice, and we'd meet promoters there. Now, when the boys got around competition, they jailed, they exceeded anything that I could teach them because when they saw their buddies doing it, kids their own age, 
But then they dug in there, and in true Clark fashion, they persevered till they got it. Pick one they're going to do you a lively one. You can all pick on this one. song or a harmonica song? I guess, I'm confused. I guess it's both. Here it goes. tiring me out because we were doing festivals on the weekends and doing revivals from Sunday to Wednesday. Uh, we were called by some people in Nashville who saw our TV show there. And uh, as a result of that, I let the boys go to Nashville and become the Clark family experience in the 1990s. Had songs on the billboard charts, one entitled Meanwhile, back at the ranch. That was the best one. But the product was so dynamic that the management and the label got in a fight over it. Who was going to have the most power? So we wound up in limbo, fell through the cracks, and a judge set us free from it. And then things started over. 
Ashley went and played for Carrie Underwood. Uh, for three years, he played the fiddle and sang harmony to her. And then they decided to try to enter a contest. This time, there wasn't six guys as the Clark family experienced because three had got into other things. But the three main pickers decided to enter this contest called the Next Great American Band. The Next Great American Band was a program put on by American Idol about two and a half years ago now. And it started off with 10,000 bands who sent in their videotapes, their auditions. 60 were picked, 60 were auditioned, and 12 were taken out of that, of which the boys were among the 12. And for 12 weeks, they battled it out. Finally, on the last night, the MC stood up among the last two groups that were standing and said, now the winner is the Clark Brothers. That's the first six boys. I call that the first family because five years went by after that before we had any more kids. Then when we did, we had three boys and two girls, which I call the second half of the family. That's the half that travels with me now. They've been taught the same way, and they're just as about as good a musicians for the first half when it comes to musicianship. They're no slouch. You're gonna have to tell who the mama is of all these kids. And here she comes, Wonder Woman. So they travel with me, those five, and Sylvia and I make seven. That's what we're doing now. Uh, I haven't had the tent up too much the last few years, but I have been in tents. Tents that other people own and put up. That's okay. I, I don't have any desire to pitch another tent myself. It's a very difficult job. Now, we always used to use our bus to go out on tour, but the last two, three years, we have not done that because of the price of diesel fuel. But we need space, so we drive minivans. Uh, Sylvia has one, and I have one, and they're packed to the rafters. And the twins drive the little pickup truck, which has a canopy on the back, and that's packed to the rafters. So. Three vehicles takes the place of the one bus. Lord Jesus Christ, help us on this highway today, safe from accidents and harms and dangers. May we stay awake. May we drive safely and defensively. And send the angels before us so that we might get there rested and ready for tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Then we go to the church the first night early and set up. Everybody sings and plays. I was called to this, born for this. Though I tried, it was impossible to escape. I understand that the sign gift ministry of revelation and miracles is still real today, still works today. And it's not fraudulent, it's not cheating, it's not uh, gimmicks. There's a lot of pretenders, phonies that's got systems that they're working to do these things. They've never paid the price to have their real genuine gift. The genuine article is not there. 
That's not to put them all down. There are some ministries that are true blue and bona fide, but there's a lot of crooks out there too, and you might as well be aware of it. Praising my God. Glory to God. You clapped your hands so much, sister, I got to pray for you. <laughs> Raise up hands. Receive your sight. 2020, come to her face today. Woo, shout. A scripture, Jesus' name. Glory to God. Wait. Look at him. How clear is that? Oh, very clear. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> well, how long have you been getting fuzzy, foggy? Long time. Long time? Yeah, long, long time. And now they're quite clear to you. Oh, yes. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You walk down to the front to the blue step and turn around and look at me. All right. You see, see my fingers? How many? You're afraid. Take your eyeballs and go sit down. Oh, glory. Are you ready now? Go. You believe God will hear you? Yes. You feel the power of the Holy Ghost, don't you? Yes. You felt that before? Yes. I promise you that if you get back to church and stay there, you'll feel the Holy Ghost just like this every time you get in church. Your sinus is going to heal up now. You want that? Yes. How long you had that? Forever. Forever. You're not that old. <laughs> Get out of the boat. Forever, she says, she's had sinus. And forever, it is gone. <laughs> Check real good. Is it open? That's just the first step, I mean, but this is open. Yes. I see you in a hospital laying on an operating table. And the doctor, who was wearing a mask over his face, he reached down in your throat. He took something out in your throat. Yeah. Did you know that he messed up the thyroid? You want your thyroid back? Uh, come back, thyroid. Whoop! Come on, you say. Swallow, see what you're feeling in here. My throat. You alone? Yeah. You ever feel it before? Do you know thyroid? <laughs> Sometimes it's healed by swallowing lumps. But in her case, she had none until now after thyroid prayer. You're amazed. This is what Pentecost is all about. This is not dead religion and denominationalism. This is apostolic Pentecost, and this is how it's supposed to be. Congratulations. You've been taken in the fold touching you. Everyone said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So you came to be healed tonight, did you? Yes. Oh, what a smart lady. Raise your antennas. Something will strike them. Now look here. You've been fighting about having a bout with arthritis. Is that right? Yes. That's what you come to be healed of. Yes. I'm seeing now you're starting to melt in certain spots. You're going to melt right there and melt down your spine in the upper half of your spine, in your hands, in your fingers, knees and legs. Arthritis, you got to go. You can't stay here. Granny came to church tonight to get rid of you. You pack your luggage and get and obey authority because you have no choice. 
Everyone said goodbye, Arthur. Hallelujah. Goodbye, Arthur. Randy, can you tell me anything about old Arthur? If you spotted him in the last two minutes? Well, I have it really bad in my feet and one hand. Stomp him on the devil's head. There you go. What'd you feel that time? Nothing. How's your hand feel? Well, I know, stretch it forth. Jesus told him to do that in the synagogue. Make a fist, punch the devil in the snout. Yes. Where's the pain in your hand? I don't have it. Why, why should you ever have it again? Hallelujah. I'm not. Well, what a smart granny. If you can be healed for two minutes, you can stay healed forever. Oh, glory to God. Raise up your hands to the Lord. Now, here's what the Lord's impressed me to do. Pray for uh, your breathing, your breathing in your lungs, like a bronchial tickle that gets down in your lungs. Yeah. You want that out? Yeah. How long have you noticed that? Long time. Long time. Now, would that mean days, weeks, months, or years? Years. Okay. Can you tell when it's gone? You think you know? Oh, yeah. Then get ready to tell. Get ready to know. Follow me, please. Receive two new lungs. Praise God. Praise God. Done. Take a deep breath now. Tell me only the truth. I, I, I'll never be guilty of leading the witness, so take your time. Breathe deeply again. What happened? Feels real nice. <laughs> You are a little stiff in these joints. Did you know what it was? I haven't a clue. Arthritis of the first stage. What? I just figured I was getting old. <laughs> but did, did you figure it was arthritis? Well, I didn't know for sure. But... Have you had a, a tobacco habit for how many years? I don't want to say. All right, don't say. But I'll say this to your tobacco. It's coming out of you because I don't want you to ruin your new lungs. God is not going to heal this man's lungs so that he can smoke better. It's an unclean spirit and it's going to leave him. Hallelujah. You nicotine devil, get your hands off him. Leave him alone. We extract you. We cast you out and forth from his flesh. So we extract this driving, lustful craving for foreign particles of smoke and leave his flesh. And be bound. Some of the keys to the kingdom. What's bound on earth is bound in heaven. What's loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. Gold in the pit, report failure to your master. Where is the tobacco taste? I don't taste it. What? I don't taste it. No more craving? No. You want the Lord to generally overhaul you? You said it. Lord, while he's sitting in his seat, go down through his body from head to foot and foot back to head. Heal him totally. Heal him from his crippled legs. Give him two new pillars beneath the temple. Don't just do that. Open up his hearing in his ears. Pressure down. Heart be healed. Hold my hand and let's walk. Here we go. Gangway. Everybody out of our way. We're plowing through. You remember how that other general overhaul walked upstairs?
and then that other Jenner overhauling woman, she walked downstairs. Outside the church. Praising God. Well, you're just skipping right along. That's right, brother. Thank God. God has added years to your life tonight. You've got longevity now. Yes, Lord. Both of them, I couldn't hardly get them out. I did have. Well, you could have fooled me the way you was running here. It's gone tonight. Praise God. That make you happy, Mama? Brother in the blue just rise. He's been sitting back there praying that I'd pray for him all night long. Well, your prayers are answered. I'm praying for you. All right, I see. There's people in your family that gets blood pressure and it goes high. And you have never admitted it to yourself, but you're starting to get a dose of it. God's taking it down. There it goes. The pain in your eyes is stopped. Gone. You can take your glasses off and look at the light and it won't bother you now. And these lights are bright. Every Charlie horse coming out of your muscles. Every muscle tension punching leaving your back, and through this food pipe of yours right here, God is touching the acid reflux and the amino acids, the enzymes, nothing's gonna come back up. You have fears, your fears are leaving. The light hurting your eyes? Come on down here and let's see if these people's faces is hurting your eyes. Hello. How clear is that? That's clear. I can see without the glasses on. I mean, I could see without the glasses on before, but I had to have sunglasses on. Now you don't need them. No, I don't need them. Thank you, Lord. Congratulations. Hallelujah. You can see these are dark. This one I was required to wear. I couldn't stand the light in my eyes. I don't need them. Except, except to read up close. I still check that out. I still need them for that, but I don't need the dark glasses no more. God healed my eyes. The brother in the leather jacket stand. Hold your glasses in your hand. You wanted to be healed of your eyes tonight, I know that. I can't promise you 2020 sight, but I can promise you that your vision will improve. You're not going blind. The spots are leaving. The floaters are gone. You're not gonna see double. And this is the best kicker right here. It's the best part of it. You have been praying that God would give you a gift of the Spirit. Have you? You did not know what to ask for when you prayed, so you pray, oh God, give me the best gift. But after a while, you settled on this gift, okay? And I'm gonna name it to you. And it's the one that's gonna start in you tonight. You ready for this? It's the gift of discerning of spirits. Is that it? You're a believer now, ain't you? 
Put up your hands, shout. It's coming to you. Ha shabahate. Woo! Kuya bahate. Shake up Hallelujah to God. Oh, it's getting real in this house. Come on, shout on the God with a voice of triumph. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Hallelujah. Shabandia. Woo! Come on. If you don't shout with him, he'll shout all by himself. God has given the desire of his heart, and the thing that he sought God for has come to his house this evening. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just stand up and praise God. Well, no wonder she can't hear. Both ears are plugged. I didn't see this. Okay. Don't worry about it. We ain't paid yet. Lord Jesus. This is an old granny, but she can still have good ears for her age. In the name of Jesus. Let her hear now. Let the victory come to her head. Do it again? Yes. <laughs> she heard me that time. God, give her another shot. <laughs> My, it did it again. I can hear. <laughs> My God, she can hear. Ready for yours? Yes. Won't cost you a dime. That's a pretty good deal, huh? That's right. Freely we receive, freely we give. Glory to God. Now, the first thing that's happened to you, God is loosening your back. Yes. How long have you needed it? Since 2005, I got hurt on my job. 2005, you got hurt on the job. Oh, no. Faith walk, everybody walks by faith. Even the heathen walk by faith. Touch your toes. Come up for air. What'd you feel in your back? Nothing. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. She just can't believe it. She got healed. She had to believe it or she wouldn't have got healed. There's more for you. You have something stuck on your throat right here around your vocal cord. How long? Nine years. Nine years. You want me to pluck it off tonight? Yes. You may swallow now and try and find it. It's gone. It's gone. Your voice is very clear. I know. <laughs> oh, you're ahead of me. You're getting way ahead of me here. But you do want more. You've been bothered with your feet. Yeah. You want the pain to go. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Do you know what's wrong with your feet? No. You're going flat-footed. You never thought of that? No. You believe it's the truth? Yeah. Well, if you believe it, you're healed. I had to step on your toes to do it. Where's the pain in your feet? They're bouncy, bouncy now. Oh, 
Jesus. Really? He got more? Let's see if there's more. Yeah, there is a pressure comes to your head here. Sometimes it's like lightheaded. And other times you can feel pain to it. It's all because you get hit in the head when you're young. Something struck you right there. And when, that's when it started. And it's been messing around chronically ever since. And there it goes. And then there was the time when you got snapped right there. Huh? I accident. Would you like to get snapped right there again? Thank you, Jesus. She ain't worried about getting snapped there right now. Would you check your neck now? Yeah. Don't ream it off. Or we just got you a new one. Glory to God. Amen. How about you, sister? If you're ready, come on down. Wow. Is this exciting? <laughs> yes. Well, I know that you love to go to an exciting church. A lot of people, they knew that God did things like this. They'd have gone to church years ago. Now, you've been depressed, been under depression. We're smiting and rebuking it. There it goes. Here is how you got depressed. You lost something something dear to you. It gave you a heartache and a heartbreak. You're still an emotional wreck. Your emotions are being healed and you're getting a new heart. Bye-bye depression. Everyone said gone, gone. Now, I have to caution you on one thing. You will now stop blaming yourself. Stop it now. It's not your fault. You had nothing to do with it. It was the work of the devil. We're going to pray now that God will heal the sinus in your head. You want that healed? Yes. How long you had that? Probably for about six months. Six months. All right. You want new nerves. Yes. Here's a new sin. I just then felt a pain come through my side. You want that gone? Yes. It's like a cramp that comes. Sometimes it's sharp. That means knife to me. I think I'll take the knife out of your stomach so you won't have to have surgery. God. Now there's a happy camper. What's wrong? November the 2nd, my daughter-in-law committed suicide, and she hung herself, and I found her. <laughs> and that has been really, really just in the back of my mind. I can't get it out. And then I am scheduled for surgery July the 25th. Did we ever meet before? No. We never talked before. Never met. No. Did you sign cards? <laughs> Did you tell ushers? No, no. Do you see any transmitters in my ears? No, no. Well, it must be God, oh, I know. Habo <laughs> Sabandre, emotional wreck. Leave her, you spirit of torment. You're gone from her head and her mind and her soul forever. This is the night. It's done. Surgery success. Thank you, body ministry. Thanks for the help. We're to agree it shall be done. She's received surgery in church. There'll be no July 25th surgery. Do you believe everything I told you? Yes, that's It was the truth. Yes. If it was the truth, then you can feel all you want to right in there. 
you will not only find nothing, you will not be cut on July the 25th. I had a hernia, but I don't have it now. I don't. Uh, you can... You cannot believe her all you want to. Don't make no difference to her. She's the one that had the hernia. She ought to know. But you will be a believer when it comes your turn. Say hallelujah to God. God bless you. What a night she's had. Did I pray for you already, sisters? Oh, come on down. At the risk of sounding like the price is right, come on down. Glory to God. Well, are you enjoying this? Oh, you are. Raise hands. You two are going to receive something that the first woman received. Look upon me now. In your hip joint and leg. Hip joint and leg. You want that? You do feel pain that comes on the left side. But there's a reason for that. The left side has to carry your weight. That's why it pains. You understand that? Now, we're going to believe God for him to grow your leg out, okay? Okay. First, the pain leaves your left side. It's gone. Everyone says, thank you, Jesus. Step again. Enough steps to check for pain in the left side. What? There's no pain in the left side. Uh, meditate on that just for a moment, just for a moment. It is not coming back to the left side either. Hallelujah to God. All right. These are the people who's going to witness this. If you're going to, if you care enough to observe it, it you better hurry those. I feel it happening already. Give me your feet. straighten out once you walk. Now, no doctor in West Virginia could have done that. Only the great physician. Now is near the sympathizing Jesus. What's it feel like walking? It don't hurt. And you feel balanced walking? You gonna keep the miracle? If I thought for one minute this wasn't real and it was an act and a theater and entertainment and a play and something I was putting on, I'd quit right now. I'd never do it again. It's got to be real or I don't want nothing to do with it because I'm standing before God one day. That's just, uh, I have a, a narrow uh, view of things. For 50 years now, Freddie Clark has continued to push the boundaries of people's faith in the healing power of Jesus Christ. Besides the people you have witnessed in this story, I have documented over 215 others that have testified to supernatural miracles similar to these in this film. In the lifetime of his ministry, he has prayed in mass for over five million people worldwide and has personally, through the laying on of hands, witnessed well over one million healings. I can't explain or even try to understand why God chooses certain people to be vessels for his healing power, but I can say that God chose Freddie Clark. In my time with him, he has set a bar in my life for a higher standard in character and faith. As I have traveled with him across the country and seen these miracles with my own eyes, I can say with confidence that these experiences are very real to me. The footage is real, the healings are real, and I can attest that the man, Freddie Clark, 
My Father is Real. In Dad's lifetime, many, many people have walked away healed believing the power of God is real. But the question is, is it real to you?